Strongholds are nothing more than thoughts inspired by Satan and informed by our experience. God has revealed to us the location where that battle is won or lost. The true condition of who and what we are does not originate just in actions or even in words, but in the intangible, immaterial realm of the mind, in our thoughts. You are God's promised land. We established that last week, that when he rescued us, when he took over the the burnt ashes and um, scorched earth of our lives before him, he began to sweep in with his Holy Spirit in order to bring restoration, in order to bring godliness and purity and growth and beauty in that promised land that is our souls. We are his possession. He sold everything he had in heaven and bought the whole world with his blood, and now we belong to him. And he's in the process of restoring us. And even though our spirits were born again, there is still a struggle going on on the inside of us, if we're honest, of some of those territories that the Holy Spirit has yet to have access to. And sometimes that access is limited or almost exclusively limited by our willingness to allow him to sweep into those areas and destroy old strongholds and addictions and attitudes and ways of viewing the world and allow the mind of Christ to come upon us and begin to move in the ways of Christ. But we don't move in the ways of Christ until we begin to think in the ways of Christ. And so that's why I'm bringing you Mindset Reset today. It's still in this strongholds theme. But let's read that scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And here's the way it goes. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now it's important to know here, he's not talking about the fact that we're in a body and we're walking in fleshly bodies. This is a whole other construct. It's a whole other way of looking at human beings. That there is this part of us that is flesh that is that thinks like human beings. It thinks at a lower level. It thinks what I can see, what I can taste, what I can touch, what I can test, in those sorts of ways. And he says, in this warfare that we war, we're not going to do it like that. We don't do it with that old mental framework. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the rules, the guidelines, the logic of the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the real you, the born-again part of you, the spirit in you, wants God to have that whole territory. You remember praying prayers like that? Lord, take all of me cleanse all of me, deliver every part of me. And I recommend we pray that regularly and not just once in our life, but regularly asking the Lord, Lord, whatever is in me that does not, is not of you, even if it's stuff I really, really like, I offer it to you. How many of you be honest enough to pray that prayer? Yeah, you got to want it to pray that prayer, don't you? You got to want Jesus more than you want some of the stuff. You got to want Jesus more than you want some of the old habits, the ways that we find comfort and consolation or entertainment or whatever that replaces where God says, you're supposed to come to me for that. I'm supposed to be that stronghold for you. I'm supposed to be the one that brings you peace and consolation and joy and fulfillment and all of those things instead of you running over there to that other place. We don't do that anymore. Anyone ever have a family rule like that? Hey, we are Gutierrez's. We don't do that, right? We're Tyler's. We don't do that. Right, and sometimes the tithers got to convince them. But you know, you you make the vision. This is what we do. This is what we used to do, and we don't do that anymore. And some of you, when you came to faith, maybe midlife, that was a big transition to go. Okay, now we walk as believers. Now we walk as people of the cross. We have a cruciform life. That's a great word. Look that up. Cruciform. But in the spirit realm, we are battling. Paul said in Galatians that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit so that you don't do what you want to do. The real you doesn't get what it wants to do because of this struggle that's going on. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I think I got this Christian life figured out. I just don't do the things I'm not supposed to do. Success. 
not his experience. He said, I try not to do the wrong thing, and I do the wrong thing. And he said, okay, maybe I'll just shift my mindset this way. Um, uh, I will do the right thing. Yeah, that's the ticket. I'll do the right thing. And he said, and I did the right thing. I tried to do the right thing and did the wrong thing. This is Romans chapter 7. It's such a struggle. And it ends with him in such frustration, O wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. And we've all experienced that struggle. Um, so the reason is, is that these, there's still these strongholds set up in our, the promised land that belongs to God, that is us, and it's still fighting for dominance in our lives. And sometimes those strongholds, are we're kind of used to them, and we got used to them, and we think it's no big deal that they stay there, except last week Jesus rolled up on our stronghold and said, that's got to go, that's got to go. If it's a stronghold of the enemy, it has no place in the believer. Because the enemy in that stronghold has designs on the rest of your life. It, it is not harmless sitting there. If you had a tumor just sitting there, you would not just let it stay there. That thing's purpose is going to be to grow, to dominate, and to bring as much destruction. The enemy's up inside that, and the, and the enemy comes for no other reason except to kill, to, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So these castles, these fortresses, the entrenchments of the enemy are in our soul, in our mind, our will, and our emotions, not in our spirit. Our spirit is right with God. It's the one that is lusting for the best things, desiring the best things that God has for us. These strongholds are antagonistic. We learned this last week. Antagonistic, lifted up barriers that speak against God's promises for our deliverance. That thing where you feel in bondage right now, that the enemy says you'll never be free of that or it's just part of your personality or why should I have to give that up, right? It's antagonizing God's knowledge of complete freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, do not give yourselves again to a yoke of slavery, Paul said. Listen to that. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. In other words, he set you free so you'd be free, right? And so he's looking at some of these, he's like, I... I did everything. I bought your freedom. I gave you the Holy Spirit. I gave you the word. I gave you everything. Why are you still bound? And the answer is sometimes because I want to be. Okay, what's a stronghold? Thoughts. It's thoughts. Wait a minute. I thought strongholds were going to be like alcoholism or porn addiction or bitterness over my divorce or a fear that I have about something. That's true. But God is telling us that the answer to our deliverance and freedom has to do with something that we can't see or reason with using the wisdom of this world. God has revealed to us the location where that battle is won or lost. He's revealed where freedom and obedience originate. The true condition of who and what we are does not originate just in actions or even in words, but in the intangible, immaterial realm of the mind in our thoughts for instance in jeremiah 17 it says that god searches the heart and tests the tests the mind he searches hearts and he tests minds well i thought god was just looking at what i did more or what i said yep that too but to be freed and delivered for real he has identified the source of action and speech is it any wonder that in the first commandment it says that we are to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, and Jesus restates it in Matthew 23, or 22, 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I'm underlining a phrase here, a word that the Lord is drawing a target on today and saying, I'm going to tell you where all the battles are fought. I'm going to tell you where victory comes or where defeat comes. Have you picked it up yet? It's in a four-letter word, but a good one. It's in your mind. See, strongholds are not just any thoughts. We have to keep that image of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 on our mind, that these, the, the strongholds, the fortresses of the enemy, they are carnal and they are fleshly. They deal with the arguments. The arguments is logismos in Greek, which means logic, reasonings. The way that we assess things before we became Christ, before we learned the word of God and learned how to navigate there were ways that we assessed people in front of us, words that they said, ways that they acted toward us. 
events that happen in our life, setbacks, sickness, all these sorts of things came with a certain interpretive lens, if you will. Like we're looking at the world through a certain set of glasses. And God has a set, and the enemy has a set, and the flesh has a set. Okay? And so the Lord is telling us that there is a set of those glasses that are antagonistic, arrogant assertions and conclusions that are raised up against the knowledge of God, saying that everything that God said is not true, or a more sly way, not true for you. I mean, maybe it's true for other people, but not for you. And, and then we get into this whole thing going on in the world today, my truth, your truth, her truth, their truth, blah, blah, blah. That was not a Greek word, but a, a feeling of my sense of that use of the word truth. Strongholds are nothing more than thoughts inspired by Satan and informed by our experience. Many of you will recognize this verse in Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let, a, let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Well, that's not there by accident. Forsake his way and his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now check this out. God's getting ready to give an assessment. Verse 8, for my thoughts, I mean, you know God's got thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. That would be a very uncomfortable confession, and I don't want to make you introverts uncomfortable, but probably some part of us should say, God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Come on, how many of you ever have a bunch of thoughts in there that are not God's thoughts? Okay, well, he's confirmed it. Yep, you're right. Those thoughts, not my thoughts. That's not the way I think, right? Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Now check this out. Nor are your ways my ways. Notice that thinking came before doing. How many of you ever talked yourself into something? How many of you talked yourself out of something? Started with thinking. Started with thoughts. I said to myself, I would. I remember my grandma used to say, I said to myself, self? Well, sometimes you have those conversations with yourself. And sometimes they're to convince you to do wrong things, ill-advised things, ungodly things, or to perceive in certain ways. Well, I'll tell you what, he didn't shake my hand, and I'll tell you why. And here comes all this fleshly assessment of things. So God's plan of freedom and deliverance starts in the mind and stays forever focused in the mind. That's where the battlefield is. On your deathbed, there is a good chance you will still be battling thoughts. As you get ready to take the biggest leap of faith ever and breathe your last and believe that Christ's blood has authorized you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. At that moment, there could be thoughts. Am I good enough? Am I right enough? Did I do enough right? Is, is, is it for real? Is it really going to happen? Or your thoughts say, I am my beloved and he is mine. I am getting ready to see my Savior face to face. He saved me. He washed me. He forgave me. He is with me. He will not forsake me and pass on into glory. You see what happens there? Other thoughts are taken captive and made to obey the obedience of Christ's words. Can you see your mind? You can see your brain on a scan, maybe. I mean, some of you are like trying to roll your eyes up in your head so you can, uh, I think I can see my brain. It's not the way it works, right? You can't see your mind, though. God didn't say love him with all your brain, but with an invisible part of who you are. The part of you that has incredible potential to change your life if it's plugged into the right source. An argument could be made that the effects of the mind are seen in brain scans, but it's still a mysterious connection in our wonderful design of spirit, soul, and body. That's why Paul told us, don't look at the things which are seen, which immediately makes us weird. You're looking at the things that's seen, don't look at that. You're looking at the things that's seen, don't look at that. It's like, you Christians are weird people. Jesus has thoughts that are not like our thoughts. And hence his ways are not like our ways. Where you and I want to try to say something and control the situation and to address it in such a way, Jesus said, I'm going to go talk to the Father. 
and I'm only going to say what he says, and I'm only going to do what he's, he's thinking different thoughts than you and I think, and he's doing different things than we usually do. We've been told repeatedly that addressing things with fleshly methods is useless when it comes to waging warfare in the spirit realm where every battle is fought and either won or lost. John 6, 6, 3. Jesus said, It is the spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits what? Nothing. The flesh profits nothing. Notice what he says next. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Check this out. As I am saying words... What are they becoming after they go into your ears? Okay, they're becoming thoughts. You're thinking about what I'm saying as I'm saying it. They become thoughts. When Jesus speaks his words, they go into our ears, right? Sometimes our spiritual ears, we're reading or we're reading the word out loud, and it goes in and they become thoughts that we are thinking. And sometimes we got to just fill ourselves with the word. Go to the Jesus Disciple class next week. Fill yourself with the word in order to make no space for those other words that we filled ourselves with just by being natural humans and naturally assessing things by our carnal, fleshly sensibilities, which are ineffective and profit nothing in the spirit. How many of you can tell this is, this is not an easy proposition, but once we get it, all oh, victory can come. I mean, and this is not the last battle you will face. There will be more battles. And if you can get this strategy on lock, that when those thoughts start filling your mind, you open your mouth with the words of Jesus. Oh, you have heard it said, well, I say to you. I think that is so smart of Jesus. I'm sure Jesus appreciates me saying that. You're really smart, Jesus. Uh, You have heard it said, but I say. I think that's a great tactic for all of our lives. Those lies, those anxieties, those worries, those depressive thoughts, all of that stuff that starts coming in, you say, oh, is that what you say? Well, here's what I say. And counter it. Parry it, for those of you who watched Olympic fencing, the three of you that did. Um, Okay, listen to Romans chapter 8. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to... See that? That's like according to the stuff of, the rules of, the sensibilities of, the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, by inference of the Scripture, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is... Come on, somebody. How many want death? All right, see, so that's not what we're after. The car, to be carnally minded is death. Do you believe God's word or not? Okay, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How many of you could use more life and peace in your life? Flip on the news, doom scrolling, all of that. You need more life and peace. The whole world could use more life and peace, and it will not get it by just using the, the logic and the reasonings of this world. Check this out. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God. Enmity is an old word, but it means bitter enemies. God is saying, for me to try to talk to someone who's got their mind just on the stuff of the flesh, it's a non-starter. God can't even get a word in because you're not even perceiving it. If anything, it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Right? And maybe even like, oh, eh, stop. What is the noise? And we don't even know that we're missing what the Lord is trying to tell us because we're operating with carnal sensibilities. We're only subject to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Even under a Christian veneer, it's still operating. And the Lord can't get a word in edgewise. He said, the carnal mind is bitter enemies with me. I can't get a word in. Because the carnal mind's enmity with God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It has no ability to be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. How many, how many of you glad we're talking about something other than bodies when we say flesh here? Otherwise, we all got a problem. 
if we're all in the flesh sitting here today and we can't please God, talk about a non-starter, but he's talking about the stuff of, the wisdom of, the template of perceiving the world and truth. So what happens when your mind is filled with the things of the world? Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their... What's the word? What, 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 what's in knowledge? What's knowledge consist of? Thoughts. Going to keep God out of my thoughts. And God gave them over to a debased, what? Mind to do. A mind to do. Keep God out of my thoughts. My mind becomes debased to do. And then notice the progression. It's mind and then deeds. To do what? To do those things which are not fitting. Now, in verse 29, we're going to see a list of the strongholds that come from a mind filled with the thoughts of the stuff of this world. Here it is, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. I'll repeat that last one for 10 bucks. I'll take a Venmo, put the QR code on the screen. And disobedient to parents. Uh, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. How many of you can see a big old list of strongholds right here? Oh, those things used to be pillars of your old life. Get me once, shame on you. Get me twice, shame on me. Anybody heard that one before? That's right, I, I ain't going to be fooled by you again. Self-protection, unforgiveness, writing people off. Oh, is that the way you're going to talk to me? I don't think so. You are dead. I'm, I'm a ghost you right now. Right? That's the old life. Some Christians still acting like that, and they're strongholds. They're strongholds. They are limiting you and want to branch out into other areas of life to bring maximum destruction. Scripture tells us that we need to set our mind on things above where Christ is. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seems like there's a question there. He's like, if I got the right audience, if that's you, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. A uh, lady asked me after one of the services, she said, tell me more about that setting your mind on things above. And I said, well, it's right there in the scripture. It's where Christ is. So it's really set your mind on Christ. Did you know that whatever you gaze upon, you will become like? Whatever you spend your time gazing upon, worshiping in a certain manner of speaking, you will become like it. And I want to say something here that uh, would be controversial in the world, but shouldn't be controversial in a church that follows the Word of God, and that is some people gaze upon other, uh, another sex that is not their own and say, if I could only be that sex, if I could only be that gender, then I will be complete. Then I will be well-defined. Then I will be all of these other things that that transition, use that word on purpose, that transition will provide me all of this stuff. And the longer they gaze upon it, and by the way, as they gaze upon it on social media, as they gaze upon it on the internet, and then the algorithms take over and just feed them that, 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 it becomes obsessive. You look upon it and look upon it and you become like it. But when we set our minds on Christ, we become like Christ. When we set our minds on Christ, our thoughts become his thoughts. And then guess what? Our ways start to become his ways. Some of you were born again and your spouse looked at you and like, normally that would set you off. What has happened? You're born again. 
the Lord has redeemed that part of your life, and now it's no longer a stronghold. And I could see maybe some spouses are going, yeah, and he's got work to do still. Uh, I get it. We all got it. We all got work. Until we are dead. Listen to Romans. He said, um, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind. The Lord has drawn his target, ground zero of where the battles go, and it is right here. Now, I wonder, does anyone think that God was surprised by neuroscience when it discovered neural pathways? Can you imagine Jesus, or you know, God in heaven saying, Jesus, did you know about that? Did you? And, and there's like neuroplasticity, which means... Even those neural pathways that are blocked in by our experience, by our socialization and all that sort of stuff, they're mapped that way that that they could change? Holy Spirit, did you do that while we weren't looking? (laughs) Listen, God's not surprised by any of that. What it means is that there is a way that we can remap our minds, our brains, to defeat old things and to embrace new things, new habits, new ways, new all of that. And God knew that. Let me give you an example. Proverbs 4, he said, give attention to my word, my son. How do you spell attention? T-I-M-E. Giving time to it. And it's health to, or it's it's, uh, strength to those who find them and health to all their flesh. By giving attention to his word. God's not surprised by that. To me, that's medical science confirming, again, God knew that. He, took, he, he spoke to a group of people who had no idea about neural pathways and neuroplasticity and all of that. And he said, here's the way you will change your life. Set your mind on me and your life will change. Set your mind on my ways and my thoughts and take all those other thoughts and make them sub, uh, to obey my thoughts. You want to talk about changing your life? See, but secular counselors and therapists and psychotherapists can only take us so far because they deny the whole existence of the spiritual root of these things. And they give you a Band-Aid and keep you coming back for 20 years, right? Because you're never fixed. You're never completely delivered. You need a Christian therapist, one who believes in the authority of God's word and can see stuff like this. Can I tell you what happens every time I preach strongholds? Christian therapists fill up my email box. Can I have your notes? I want, my, I want my patients to know this right away. Why? They want their people to be free. They want to, and they can get free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen. So, Colossians says, set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. Now look at all these strongholds in verse 5 of that same passage. Here it is. Here's what, once you set your mind on things above, here's what gets to fall. Therefore, put to death your members. Paul is so good at this. He tells you all the wonderful things Jesus did, all the wonderful things that God did, and he uses the hammer of therefore. He's like, here it comes. Now walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Respond in your life now to the goodness and the grace of God by doing this. And he says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the... You know, some pastors read this passage wrong. Put to death your members. That's not a way to be, folks. We need to love our members. We're under shepherds of the the flock. There's no death penalties for church members. Okay? Um, Listen, put to death your members, and he's going to tell us what these members are. It's part of the carnality. It's part of the flesh. And here's the way it goes. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked... When you lived in them. So if you once walked in them, you shouldn't be walking in them now. You shouldn't be walking in covetousness, which is idolatry. You shouldn't be walking in passion and uncleanness and fornication, which is all sexual sin. Okay? That's not his plan for us, and it hurts us, and it hurts the people around us. So our minds and our thoughts are powerfully prophetic. Did you know that? Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. If you grew up hearing words, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, guess what most kids think? I'm stupid. Okay? So parents, we can build strongholds in the lives of our kids with our words and with our actions. 
Because the strongholds that are in us are never satisfied to just stay in us. They want to branch out into other people. They want to cut down other people. They want to wound other people with the arrows of our words and such. And those fiery darts of the enemy that we always talk about quenching with our shield, sometimes they're coming out of our mouth, impaling other Christians. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Is that right? Okay. So our heart, our, in our mind, our thoughts are powerfully prophetic. Um, you can tell what's in a man's heart by what comes out of his mouth. Some of you driving over here today, someone cut you off. And... I mean, it was elevation from worship just right before that. And then all of a sudden, this, you, that was not a language in tongues, by the way. You were, you were saying some stuff. You're like, where did that come from? I'll tell you, it came out of your heart. It came out of some stronghold that's got a big red button on it that says, if you want to tick this guy off, just do that or say that. You want to make her mad, do this or say that. And whoo, stronghold. It's a stronghold. And God says it's devoted for destruction. It's got to go. It's got to go. God knows that whatever fills our hearts, our minds, our souls is so powerfully predictive and prophetic or powerless and pathetic. God knows how this works. He designed it. And it can do so much good or it can be infested with strongholds influencing and dictating our activities and our attitudes. Listen to Ezekiel 38.10. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. Starts in the mind, then we make our plans. We need to get a handle on our mind. Or at the risk of triggering some of you, we need mind control. All right, tech team, put the spinning image on the screens. Now watch the image. Okay, I'm going to have you clicking like chickens here in just a minute. No, it's not hypnosis. I'm not going to throw magic powder on you to all of a sudden control your minds. That would be way easier than what we're called to. In 2 Corinthians, it said, for the weapons of our. No, but Jesus is going to do it. Jesus is going to do it. He's going to get my mind right. The weapons of our warfare. The weapons are his. The origin of the power, the authority to do all of it is his. But he's given it to us and says, now do it. Now you do it. You cleanse your mind. You take those thoughts captive. Okay, it's part of free will, which is an ultimate act of love. Sometimes I think, God, if you're just not giving me free will, then this could be all be great. But think about it. The ultimate act of free will, or the ultimate act of love is free will. Now, I don't know if you, some of you have been crushing on somebody and you're like, oh, I love them. And then you capture them and put, you, put them in your basement. <laughs> You're going to love me. <laughs> um, that's a big time felony. <laughs> the police will come. It's the freedom that we have to choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If the Lord is God, serve him. Okay, so the Lord doesn't lock us in. He doesn't make us do anything. He offers the ability. He offers the ability, the anointing, the authority. He gives us divine tools to do all this stuff. And sometimes I think my angels are sitting around going, this guy is a knucklehead today. Look at him. He could be using his words to take those thoughts captive. Instead, he's stuck in one thought after another after another. I should have gone like this. After another, after another, he's crazy. Look at Psalm, uh, Psalm, First Peter chapter one verse thirteen. Just freak the tech team out. Psalms, that's not in the list. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Full stop. Paul uses a lot of metaphors, but this one's a little uncomfortable. All right, do you know where your loins are? Don't point. You know what your loins consist of? Don't describe it. Okay. What happens in the loins of a human being? That's where all the reproductive organs are. That's where babies come from. I just helped some of you parents right there. You're welcome. Okay? It is reproductive. Now, I think this word is being used, inspired by the Holy Spirit, on purpose. Because your mind is a reproductive center. 
How many of you have ever been riddled with anxiety? That anxiety started with one thought. And it started to multiply, 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 multiply. And before you know it, you're in the fetal position in the corner of your room with all the lights off, whimpering. It can get there. How many of you have ever had doubtful thoughts, full of doubt? It started with one thought. Some of you got rabbits up there in your mind, right? And they are just reproducing like crazy. And before you know it, you got whole herds of thoughts, rabbits everywhere. Okay? He's saying that our minds have the ability to reproduce certain kinds of thinking. It can totally reproduce as much as you will let it. But he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope that didn't bum anybody out. Be sober. And rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, here comes a list of strongholds, not conforming yourselves to your former lusts, those old strongholds, those old ways of thinking and being and doing, as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Our problem as good religious people is we generally start trying to be holy from the outside and then hope the inside will transform. And he's saying, no, no, no. You start in the mind and holiness will shine outward and that will be proper. But as long as I can fake you out by looking good, sounding good, being charismatic, but being full of bondages and strongholds, no wonder we see people in spectacular falls from grace. Because the outside looked good, sounded good, looked good. It's like Jesus said, they look good on the outside, right? These whitewashed walls, these graves, they look good on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. How many of you, you don't want that? At least your spirit is going, amen! Amen! I don't want that anymore. I'm tired of dealing with this knucklehead soul, this mind, this will, this emotions. Then let your spirit lead. Let your spirit speak. Stop shutting it down. And instead, give it a microphone in your mind. And tell those rabbits to start reproducing those thoughts. Get busy with the thoughts of peace, the thoughts of safety, the thoughts of security. Gird up the loins of your mind. Gird is a word that means to prepare for battle, to prepare your mind for battle. To gather up clothing, those undisciplined thoughts. Fear, get up here. Depressing thoughts, get up here. In Ephesians 6, it talks about girding your waist with truth. Jesus said, your word, O Lord, is truth. So how am I going to gird myself with God's word? Your mind is a reproductive center of the spiritual realm. A production center that prepares me to win or lose or forfeit battles. The productive center of my mind, when paired with God's truth, prepares me for victory in battle. Exodus 12, God tells them to gird themselves as they prepare for deliverance and from bondage in Egypt. In Luke 12, Jesus tells them to gird their waist while they expect his return to save them ultimately. Do you need peace? Isaiah 26, 23 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed up on him because he trusts in God, right? Now listen, strongholds, whether evil or whether righteous, are places of safety. They're places we run to in trouble. They're places we run to for our identity, our security, our prosperity, our whatever. And if we are running to those evil things, those things that actually are set on our destruction, there won't be peace. But he's saying, put your trust in me. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our stronghold. We're supposed to be coming to him for that. I love uh, one of our team members pointed out this last week that in Hebrew, it says you will keep him in shalom, shalom. Just like a a double whammy wouldn't be the right word in a Christian setting, Um, but just like a double shot of peace. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he tells us what his thoughts are towards us. You think, some of you think that God's opinion of you is very poor. But if you're in covenant with him, I want you to remember what Paul said in Timothy. When we are faithless, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself. God made a decision. When you're floundering in faith, he is still be faithful. He has put his mark on you. 
When you traded your life for his, he meant it. He took your life. He took responsibility for meeting your needs, for healing your body, for setting the trajectory of your life, from getting you free from everything. You are now God's responsibility. Did you know that? Well, I got to be responsible. I, look, there's a part of that that's true, but ultimately, what can you change? We can change very little. As someone who has a control problem. That's one of my strongholds. Man, I want to control people's, you know, their, their, their little hearts and their reactions and all this sort of stuff. And it's tiring. Try to keep people from hurting themselves. Stop running with scissors, metaphorically speaking, you know. And at some point, people just, they're going to do what they're going to do. But I don't need to be racked with fear and anxiety and all that stuff in the same time. Well, that was for free. Um, listen. This is a dream God has to get his thoughts in your mind. 1 Samuel 2.35 says this, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Now we look back from the New Testament, we say, oh, he's talking about Jesus that will come, he'll be that faithful high priest. When this was written, they didn't have any idea about Jesus coming. The whole idea of Messiah wasn't fully formed yet in the ancient Hebrew mind. But what this is saying is, I'd like somebody who could get my thoughts into their thoughts and they would be able to do what I need them to do, which would, by the way, benefit them. To live righteous and holy lives is a benefit to us. But pastor, my mind's so jacked up. I get it. I get it. And that is an honest confession to say you are riddled with these things. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. When, when a, words are strung together like that, but one thing I do, we ought to pay attention to what comes next. Forgetting. Forgetting. One pastor put it like this, the usury of forgettery. Okay? Practicing forgetting. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, what? Have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We need mind control. We need mind control. Philippians 4 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. We want that peace that passes understanding in our lives, but we won't get it by dealing with our lives like we did in the past. Tequila won't fix it. But if we've learned that that will ease the anxiety in our minds, and that is a well-worn pathway, uh, I heard some, some uh, uh, I forget, because I know there's a variety of, in, under the Hispanic uh, cultural setting, but he said, you know what we called it? Tequila. Because <laughs> it's meant to kill you. I'm like, okay. I'm... It certainly does give a certain lens to it, doesn't it? That stuff is not designed to help. Because when you wake up the next morning, the problem's still there. Maybe worse. Maybe worse. Do not be drunk with wine where it is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's putting yourself. Now check this out in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever. How many of you think Paul should have just used a comma? Whatever things are, what, 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 over and over and over again. But I want to tell you what's going on here. What I think is going on here is Paul is saying, there are so many things that are true. There are so many things that are noble. There are so many things that are just. There are so many things that are pure. So many things that are lovely. So many things that are good report. So many things that have virtue and are praiseworthy. There should be little space inside the mind of a believer with all this goodness to think and reflect upon for these other types of thoughts to get in there that bring bondage and lies Talk us out of our deliverance, talk us out of our freedom, and into more bondage when there's so much beauty to reflect upon. Meditate. I mean, you know, that's a thinking operation. 
meditate upon these things. What we need is a mindset reset. Let me try to give you a lens that will help you. Because these strongholds come in in times of trauma and setback, sometimes success. Or we get a little up on ourselves. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really getting it done. And then there's a pride stronghold where we don't even seek the Lord's help because I got it on lock. I'm all good to go. And we know that all things, that good things, bad things, meh things, Skibbity Ohio things. Well, oh, I just blew some Gen Alpha's mind right there. How does that old man? It's the gospel according to TikTok. That's why. Um, all things work together. God synergizes. That's the Greek word, synergeo. It's where we get that word synergy, using everything together. And, he, and by the way, that, that promise is not for unbelievers. So sometimes people come along and it's not in the faith context that all oh, everything's going to work out. It's all going to be fine. Everything happens for a reason. All they don't get this scripture. It is to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If they want that promise, they need to come on over. Come on in. The water's fine, right? They need to get on in through the waters of baptism and become a follower of Jesus. And they can have this assurance that no matter what comes my way now, no matter what that person does to me, says to me, my assessment now has this hope that even that which is negative or persecuting or demeaning or whatever that might be coming my way, God's using it. God's using it. We used to have this saying in where I grew up. I spent some time in Texas and Oklahoma, and they would say, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Right? Can't make a silk purse out of a pig's ear. They had this other saying, and maybe you're more familiar with this one, you can't make ice cream out of droppings. Let's just say it that way. Can I tell you who's a master of doing that? Jesus is. You're all proof of it. Because I was a sow's ear, and I was droppings before I came to Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a real view of total depravity of the human heart. In my flesh dwells no good thing. But, but the words that he speaks are spirit and they are life. When he spoke those words of rescue to me and salvation to me, all that garbage that I used to be became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It became heir and joint heir of the promise. I became heir and joint heir with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am not just nobody. I am not nothing. I am my beloved and he is mine. That is me taking all the thoughts of inferiority and thoughts of rejection and all this stuff that would be coming at me and saying, God synergizing all of it. <laughs> you, you meant it for evil. Remember what Joseph said? You meant it for evil, but God used it for good. Look at that. Look at that. All of a sudden, the lenses don't allow now strongholds to take root. It's like the, the insecticide for, or the herbicide for strongholds. It won't allow them to take root because it can't ultimately, no one can pluck me out of his hand. No one can ultimately harm me. You kill me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You just can't keep me down. Why? Because Christ raised me up. Because Christ raised me up. This is the mindset reset. All right, let's close. When we apply ourselves to seeing the unseen and we apply the discipline of our minds to do that warfare that we've been given and, our, and as we replace our thoughts, our perceptions, our ways with God's thoughts, his perceptions, his way, his way of viewing the world and viewing the believer, then and only then do we get to have 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, which promises this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Can I tell you something about the mind of Christ? Not a stronghold in it. <laughs> you believe that Jesus actually sits up in heaven and has no doubt about anything. Can you believe that Jesus is not worried? That he's not surprised 
about stuff that he is in complete and perfect peace, that's how he can give it to you. He believes his, his intercessions with the Father are effective. Imagine if we thought our prayers were as effective as that. With this all-powerful, settled, and all-good mind of Christ, we cast down thoughts that are contradictory to the thoughts of God. We instruct our soul to resist conforming to the pattern of this world, but to be renewed by the spirit of our minds. Let's stand together. I've got a few little prayers I'd like for us to pray together that I think will help seal the deal on this. Are you ready? So I'm going to say it, and then let's repeat it together. God, I accept your thoughts towards me. I deny the lying accusations and the false prophecies about my destruction. Lord, open my eyes in the spirit to see you as you are. High and lifted up. Eyes of love fixed on me. Lord, give me your eyes to see the events of my life and remind me how you've restored me. Show me how you're going to heal, how you're going to restore from that trauma in the battlefields of my life. Give me faith and strength to go to that stronghold in my mind and to release myself, to release others with the same power of forgiveness that you forgave me. Lord, show me me. Cause the gospel mindset to do a reset in my own mind. I take every other thought captive to the supreme and excellent knowledge of God. I reject contrary and negative thoughts, doubt-filled thoughts, and I embrace your thoughts towards me and your thoughts about me. That which is not of you, God let it no longer be in me. I am all yours. No strongholds are allowed to stay in me. I don't want to limit your work in me to free me, to serve you. I am free. I am delivered. I'm a forgiver. I am abounding in grace. I am restored and renewed. And I am healed in Jesus' name. Amen.